Good day. Welcome to the Sunday School presentation for February 13th, 2022, the second Sunday of February. Uh, we are so delighted that you chose to spend time with us in the study of God's holy word. Our lesson today continues in uh, the winter quarterly theme, which is entitled Justice, Law, and History. And we are in the third unit, which is entitled Justice and Adversity. And our lesson today comes from the book of Ezra, the seventh chapter, verses 1 through 10, and then verses 23 through 26. It is entitled, Ezra Seeks God's Law. Let's bow our heads, please, in a word of prayer. Lord God, we thank you again for another Lord's Day. We thank you for the morning worship experience, and we thank you for now this opportunity to focus and hone ourselves into the study of your holy word. We ask now, dear God, that you would move everything else out of our world way so that we might have clarity and focus in our time of sharing and the study of your word, that we might be able to glean something substantial from this experience that would be beneficial in our personal walk with you. Help us now to spend this time in the wisest manner possible. In the name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. This lesson is historical and theological. It, it, it's interesting to note because the entire book is entitled Ezra, but Ezra is not introduced to us as a person until chapter 7. In fact, uh, these first verses of Ezra chapter 7 introduce us to Ezra and give us some idea of his background. The six previous chapters recorded events that took place several years before the physical Ezra ever personally can't be became involved. The first group that returned from Babylonian and Medo-Persian captivity, uh, we say Babylonian because it was the Babylonians that originally took Judah away from Jerusalem and uh, made it into a uh, refugee or a city-state of another nation. But <clears throat> the Babylonian Empire was later overrun by the Medo-Persian Empire, and so it was more than just Babylonian captivity. It was also uh, Medo-Persian captivity. The first group that returned, returned in 536 BC, led by Zerubbabel. Ezra led a group that returned some 80 years later in 458 BC. These things happened during the reign of Artaxerxes, who was the son of Xerxes, who reigned in the Medo-Persian Empire uh, in the time of Esther. If you've ever read the book of Esther, Esther deals with uh, her encounters with Artax Xerxes. Uh, also, Nehemiah deals with Artax Xerxes. From a theological standpoint, the lesson emphasizes first the sovereignty and providence of God. God is repeatedly described as gracious, powerful, and responsive to the prayers of his people. But the lesson also makes mention of the importance of prayer and fasting. All of us are aware of the importance of prayer, or at least I hope we are. We should be aware of the importance of prayer. Fewer of us believe that fasting is beneficial to us in this day and time. But both the Old and the New Testament give support to the idea of fasting being coupled with prayer. Though only one fast was specifically commanded in the Old Testament, and that is during the Day of Atonement, Leviticus chapter 16, verses 29 through 31, people did often fast on their own or at the behest of others when they wanted God to hear their prayers. The purpose of the fast was to humble oneself, was to impoverish oneself spiritually, before God. 
believing that such humiliation would be pleasing in God's sight and would result in God giving them what they desire. Such is the case here with Ezra. And we'll get into that in just a moment. But continuing with the whole idea of fasting, in the New Testament, Jesus fasted in time of temptation. Matthew chapter 4. Jesus taught his disciples about fasting in Matthew chapter 6, verses 16 through 18. Jesus also foretold of a time in which his disciples would fast, but suggested that it was inappropriate to fast when the occasion doesn't call for it. Fasting would have a place in the disciples' lives, but only on appropriate occasions, not as a ceremonial rite. And there is scripture to support that. Matthew 9, 14 through 17, Mark 2, 18 through 20, Luke 5, 33 through 39. Beyond Jesus... The early church also fasted in their service to the Lord. That's recorded in Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 3, and in Acts chapter 14, verses 21 through 23. Paul regarded fasting as a mark of his ministry, and thus it was appropriate for him to do so. In the same way, it is appropriate for us, though not mandatory, that we employ fasting in our worship of God today. I want it, I want to say that again. It is appropriate, but it is not mandatory. I, I know that there are some people who think that you must fast. No, fasting is something that you have, uh, that, that it is appropriate for you to engage in should you feel led to do so. But it should not be a compulsory thing. It should not be something that somebody else presses on you that is against your will. Uh, Whereas Whereas prayer is always important and always necessary and God's children, God's disciples, God's servants should always engage in regular communication with God. And if the only time you pray is when you come to church on Sunday morning, shame on you. Uh, while, while, while prayer is always important and necessary, fasting is something that we do uh, that benefits us more than it does anything else. Fasting is not going to make God do what we want him to do just because we're fasting. Fasting is our our divorcing ourselves from physical needs, emphasizing the spiritual because it helps us to focus on the things that God would have us to do. All right, so let's get into the first uh, section of this printed lesson. And, and I'm going to admit that some of these names uh, I'm probably going to stumble over, but this is a part of the printed lesson. I don't know why they felt the need to include this. They could have started very easily with verse six, but they include verses one through five. After all this, Ezra, it was during the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia. Ezra was the son of Sariah, son of Azariah, son of Hilkiah, son of Shalom, son of Zadok, son of Ahitub, son of Amariah, son of Azariah, son of Merioth, son of Zeriah, son of Uzi, son of Buki, son of Ibishua, son of Phineas, son of Eleazar, son of Aaron the high priest. Why all of that is necessary for us in the printed lesson, I do not know, but those are the names that are included. Then verses 6 uh, and 7, that's Ezra. He arrived from Babylon, a scholar, well practiced in the revelation of Moses that, God of, that the God of Israel had given. Because God's hand was on Ezra, the king gave him everything he asked for. Some of the Israelites, priests, Levites, singers, temple security guards, and temple slaves went with him to Jerusalem. It was in the seventh year of Artaxerxes, the king. 
Ezra's lineage shows that he is a descendant of Aaron, which qualified him to be a priest. And, and perhaps that's why uh, the editors of our Sunday School lesson felt the need to include that portion in the printed lesson. Uh, but you could have done that without doing uh, all those names that nobody knows and nobody's going to remember. But Ezra is also called a skilled teacher in the law of Moses. Specifically, Ezra was a scribe. And what that means is that his job was to copy and study copies of the scriptures. In doing this work, scribes often gained a good knowledge of the books they were copying, which would explain why Ezra was a teacher. Understand, the work of a scribe was to sit there with scripture and hand copy it from one piece of parchment or one scroll and place it on another. There was no Xerox. There was no copy machine. Anything that was copied was done by hand. It was tedious work. It was long work. And it was work that required a great deal of focus. There's a reason why there's an eraser on the other end of a pencil. Because quite often we are guilty of making mistakes. And we have to make erasures. That's one of the reasons why uh, uh, we have to be careful with... Uh, which version of the scripture we study. It's one of the things that makes the King James Version so unreliable because it comes from later manuscripts than some of the more contemporary uh, English translations, which means that there was greater length of time to allow for errors uh, to make their way into the copying of the text. Uh, Ezra's job was to copy the text and to do it uh, as accurately as he possibly could. The text does not suggest that Ezra was perfect at it, but it does suggest that he was very efficient at his task. And because he spent so much time copying the scripture, he also, uh, a benefit of that, was that he came to understand or know the scripture uh, very well because that's what he spent his time doing. And so he is more than just a copyist. He is more than just a scribe. He's also adept at teaching the scripture. But the most important thing that is said about Ezra is not that he was a copyist or a scribe, not that he was a teacher, but that the hand of the Lord was upon him. And it was because God's hand was on him that King Artaxerxes gave to Ezra the things that he required in order to uh, move the people toward the rebuilding of Jerusalem. The point for us is this. God does not call us to a work that he does not equip us to complete. God does not call us to a work that he does not provide a means for our success. In permitting Ezra to serve as a scribe, God gifted him with the opportunity to become a knowledgeable teacher of the word. And in opening the heart of Artaxerxes to respond kindly to Ezra's request for supplies, God made success available. And for us, the point is what God did for Ezra, he'll also do for us. God does not call us to a work that he does not equip us to complete. And what that also means is that if we don't find ourselves equipped to complete a work, perhaps it's a work that God has not called us to. We always have to be on guard against us calling ourselves to do a work and God actually calling us to do a work. Verses 8 through 10, they arrived at Jerusalem in the fifth month of the seventh year of the king's reign. <clears throat> Ezra had scheduled their departure from Babylon on the first day of the first month. They arrived in Jerusalem on the first day of the fifth month under the generous guidance of his God. Ezra had committed himself to studying the revelation of God, to living it, and to teaching Israel to live its truths and ways. Ezra 
left Babylon, the scripture says, on the first day of the first month of the seventh year of Artaxerxes' reign, and he arrived in Jerusalem four months later on the first day of the fifth month. With him were priests, Levites, and people of various other occupations. The temple servants are called Nethanim. In other passages, they are mentioned in Ezra chapter 2, chapter 8, in 1 Chronicles chapter 9, but their history and origin are uncertain. Ezra 8 and 20 records that David appointed them to help the Levites in the temple service. There are four important steps that are described here regarding Ezra's attitude toward the law. First, he prepared his heart. If we are to be acceptable, all service to God must come from the heart. It must originate in the heart. We will never properly learn God's will, let alone do and teach others God's will, until we get our own hearts right. Proverbs 4 and 23 support that. Acts 17 and 11 supports that. Secondly, Ezra committed himself to study. And we can never do God's will until we know what God's will is. And the best way for us to know God's will is to study the word of God. God reveals himself to us in any number of ways. It's not simply through the Bible. It's not exclusively through the Bible. But the Bible is one of the best revelations of God available to us. God reveals himself to us through the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. But one of the works of the the Holy Spirit, according to Jesus, is to help us to understand the word of God and to rightly apply it in our lives. And if we don't avail ourselves to the word of God, then the Holy Spirit can't help us to interpret the word of God and rightly apply it because we have not given ourselves access to it. The word of God is extremely important. And so we must commit ourselves to study. And when we do that, then we become experts experts in the law. And when I say an expert in the law, I don't just mean what it says. I mean what it means. Quite often, we, we, we get caught up in uh, the specifics of what a word says. We get caught up in, in, in the letter of the law and not the spirit of the law. The spirit of the law is far more important than the letter of the law. As we come to discover when we read about Jesus' encounters with Pharisees and Jewish orthodoxy in the New Testament, at one point, Jesus says to a group of Pharisees who were uh, experts in the letter of the Old Testament covenant, uh, talking about the Sabbath with Jesus and, and about his seemingly breaking with the traditions of the Sabbath. Jesus responds by saying the Sabbath was made for man not man for the Sabbath. And the point he was making is it's important to know the spirit of the law and not just the letter of the law. The third thing that's said here is that Ezra employed what he learned, which speaks to what I was just saying. Knowledge is worthless without appropriate application. Many know what God expects, but they don't practice it. For example, for, for, forget about Sabbath for a second. Let's talk about love. Let's talk about agape love. Let's talk about love without limit and without restriction. We know what God says about love, don't we? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. As I have loved you, so should you love one another. Love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them that use you and persecute you. We know what God says about love. We have knowledge of it. The question is, do we rightly apply it? Do we practice it? It's not enough to know. You have to be willing to apply what you know. And that's the third thing that is said here about Ezra. The fourth thing is that he taught others what he had learned. 
You can't teach what you don't know, and you will never teach effectively what you don't practice. As the body of Christ, we today are obligated to obey God and to be teachers to the extent of our ability by employing others and imploring others to follow our example of letting God lead us. That's all throughout the scripture. Acts chapter 8, verses 1 and 4. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2 and 24 through 26. It's not enough for us uh, to know it. It's not enough for us to apply it. We must also share with others what we have learned. Four things that are said. Uh, Ezra prepared his heart. Ezra committed himself to study. Ezra employed what he learned and Ezra taught others what he had learned. Your lesson then skips. There, there are interim verses uh, uh, that, that, that are left out and, and the lesson picks up in verse 23. In those interim verses, uh, there, there are a couple of things that we want to point out. In Ezra 7, verses 12 through 18, we have the beginning of the decree Artaxerxes made authorizing Ezra to lead people to Judah. Artaxerxes decreed that Ezra could go to Jerusalem and take with him all Israelites, including priests and Levites, who voluntarily chose to go. He was to go to see how the people in Jerusalem and Judah fared with regard to their obedience to the law, and he was authorized to take with him silver and gold from the king and his advisors as an offering to their God. The people could send free will offerings for the service in the temple, and they were to be used to buy animals and other substances for offerings. In Ezra chapter 7, verses 19 through 23, we learn that they could also take with them articles that could be used in the temple. The king issued a decree to those beyond the river who were in charge of the king's treasure to give Ezra whatever he requested, up to 3.75 tons of silver, three and three quarter tons of silver, 600 bushels of wheat, 600 gallons of wine, 600 gallons of olive oil, and unlimited amounts of salt. Other things needed for the temple could be bought or provided from these gifts. In other words, what we find in these interim verses is what we learn uh, as kind of a summary statement in the early part of the chapter, that God not only made provision for Ezra to go, but God also made provision for Ezra to succeed. And again, it emphasizes the fact that God doesn't call us to a work that he does not prepare us and equip us to do and will not call us to a work without giving us the resources in which to do them. All right, back to the printed lesson. Let, let, let's wrap this lesson up. Verse 23. Everything the God of heaven requires for the temple of God must be given without hesitation. Why would the king and his sons risk stirring up his wrath? Also, let it be clear that no one is permitted to impose tribute, tax, or duty on any priest, Levite, singer, temple, security guard, temple servant, or any other worker connected with the temple of God. I authorize you, Ezra, exercising the wisdom of God that you have in your hands to appoint magistrates and judges so they can administer justice among all the people of the land across the Euphrates who live by the teaching of your God. Anyone who does not know the teaching, you teach them. Anyone who does not obey the teaching of your God and the king must be tried and sentenced at once. Death banishment, a fine, prison, whatever. This is Artaxerxes talking, giving uh, continued instruction to Ezra. He decrees that those who serve in the temple should not have to pay any form of taxes. He authorizes Ezra to set up a system by which judges and other rules can't other rulers can make sure that God's law was properly enforced. And he says that those who would not obey the law would be punished. 
The most severe punishment would be death. The least severe punishment would be imprisonment. What this serves to remind us is that laws must be enforced in order for them to be effective. And people must know the laws in order to be able to obey them. Our duty as Christians is to teach people the law of God. And somebody's going to say, well, that means teaching them the Ten Commandments. No, it, it really does not. I, 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 I look in, in churches across the length and breadth of this country, and I'm always taken aback when I see uh, somewhere framed on the wall of a sanctuary the Ten Commandments. Jesus was asked, which was the greatest commandment? And Jesus didn't mention one of the ten. When Jesus was asked which was the greatest commandment, he listed two. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. The law of God that we are to teach is love. Love without limit and without restriction. Love for everyone, which does not mean that we love everything that everyone does, but we have to love the person. And when I say have to, it is an obligation on our part as disciples of Christ to love everyone. I might not love what you do. I might not love what you stand for. I might not love what you espouse what you speak from your mouth. I might not love your behavior, but I cannot call myself a Christian and say that I don't love you. Love without limit and without restriction is the law of God. And it is our duty as Christians to teach people that law and then to work diligently to enforce it in our daily living. We should give thanks to God for our blessings even when they come through other people because it is God who makes it possible. God moves in and through people. Sometimes people who you wouldn't think he's moving through. In this case, Artaxerxes gives Ezra permission and great latitude to do the work that, 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 that uh, God would have Ezra to do. Artaxerxes was the king of a uh, conquering nation. Artaxerxes was, was, was the power of government that held God's people in captivity. One would not expect that such a generous response would come from one such as Artaxerxes. But it lets you know that God can use anybody. It doesn't necessarily mean that Artaxerxes believed in God, in our God. There's nothing in the text that suggests that Artaxerxes becomes a worshiper of our God. It does not say so in Ezra. It does not say so in Nehemiah. It does not say so in Esther. But what we do know is worshiper or not, follower or not, Artaxerxes was used by God in order to bring about the, the restoration of Israel, to, to begin the process of the restoration of Israel. And in so doing, Artaxerxes calls Ezra to accountability and responsibility to uplift the law of God and see to it that that law is followed in the land during the restoration period. God can use anybody. God can use any situation. We are living in some very contentious and difficult times. We, we, we are living in some uh, evil times. And yet, if we have faith in God and if we believe that God is omnipotent and omniscient, then we must believe that through these circumstances, God is going to work out something wonderful for his people. There's a reason why Paul says all things work together for the good to those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. We must never deviate from that belief system. We must stand on it. We must look for it and we must wait for it so that we can respond and act when the opportunity presents itself.
Lord God, thank you for this time of sharing in the study of your word. We pray that what has been said and done here has been pleasing in your sight, edifying to your people, and uplifting to your holy and righteous name. As we prepare now to go back into our mid-morning worship, go with us and give leadership and direction to all that we say and do. In the name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. We'll see you at the 11 o'clock hour. God bless you.